Hello and welcome to the Coford Lecture Series. My name is Brian Whitney and I'm one of the editors with Greg Coford Books. Tonight's live stream is part of an ongoing series of discussions held with our authors on a variety of topics. For those of, uh, who are joining us for the first time, we welcome you. And if you're interested in checking out any of our past live stream discussions, they are archived on our podcast, which is the Greg Coford Books AuthorCast. That podcast is available through most podcast players or on our website at gregcoford.com. Just a brief announcement before we get started. We are currently offering 30% off of Select Church History, Doctrine, and Book of Mormon titles uh, through Memorial Day, May 25th. In addition, we are also offering 30% off Women at Church, magnifying Mormon women's local impact in paperback. I'm gonna go ahead and drop a link to that in the comment section. You can get these deals exclusively through our website at gregcofer.com. And uh, that brings us to our guest tonight. Tonight, we're pleased to bring you a discussion with Nylan McBain. Nylan is an American writer and marketer. As a writer, she focuses on topics related to women in the church. She has been published in pathos.com, powerofmoms.com, Newsweek, Dialogue, Segola, Meridian Magazine, and bustedhalo.com. She wrote How to Be a 21st Century Pioneer Woman in 2008 and Women at Church, Magnifying LDS Women's Local Impact in 2014. And she is the founder and editor-in-chief of the Mormon Women Project. In 2017, Nyland co-founded Better Days 2020, a nonprofit that popularizes Utah women's history through education, legislation, and art. You can learn more about the Mormon Women Project at mormonwomen.com, and you can learn more about Better Days 2020 at betterdays2020.com. And thanks for joining us, Nylan. Hi, happy to be here. So let me just quickly outline tonight's discussion. Um, our first topic is we're going to be looking at progress made towards increased women's voices and visibility in the church since the publication of Women at Church. Uh, after that, we'll discuss the current pandemic situation and uh, how home church is affecting women. And then finally, we'll discuss some recently published material by uh, some research material by BYU regarding women's voices, and we're going to relate it to a church setting. How does that sound, Nyland? Sounds great. Thanks, great. Ryan. So for those of you who are joining us through Facebook Live, we invite you to post your comments, your questions, and uh, we'll try to incorporate those in as we go along. So let's go ahead and get started with our first topic on uh, changes in the church over the past five years. Uh, so Nylon, since the publication of Women at Church at, in 2014, what moves towards greater visibility and voice for women have we seen implemented? Yeah, so um, I think one of the most important things to talk about when we're first addressing the impact of women at church was is to talk about the audience it was intended for and the whole first half of the book. So uh, in 2012, when I first gave a speech uh, about the, the discomfort that some women in the church feel uh, at a, a conference, I was greeted at that time with claims of apostasy and heresy, and it was, seemed very radical, uh, and it seemed very uncomfortable for that particular audience that I was speaking with, but also, I mean, for for many people that I spoke with even anecdotally after that conference. Um, and and so I think just thinking that that was less than 10 years ago, that was you know eight years ago, uh, I think is an important aspect of looking at the impact of the book and what's changed since then. Because after that experience of speaking in 2012, when the book came out in 2014, I really wanted to address that particular audience. And I really wanted to make it comfortable to talk about some of the struggles that uh, some women in the church have and validate those struggles for an audience that might not have explored that before or might not have personal experience with those uh, those concerns and those those struggles. So the first half of the book is about addressing uh, the pain uh, of of some of our members in uh, in the way that the lack of um, parity affects 
women and men in the church. And I have to say, and, and then to go on, this, the second half of the book was, you know, very concrete and ideas for exploring how our administrative practices on the local level could be adapted and shifted within the guidelines that the handbook at the time laid out for increasing women's uh, visibility and voice and impact. Uh, those are really the things that I am interested in, the visibility, voice, and impact. Um, and so, so I, again, I, wanted, I just want to emphasize that the first half of the book seemed really, really radical in 2012, 2014. Very gratifyingly, uh, since the book came out, it seems like that conversation has become a lot more sort of um, demilitarized and it's even bubbled up to um, the, the general leadership where we see very concerted efforts now to shift language, shift understanding of priesthood, um, highlight certain things, give women um, you know, certain unofficial titles such as Elder Christofferson's you know, keepers of moral authority, things like that. So you can think what you will about those particular solutions, but there's obviously a move to find a solution um, and and I think that that's been a really really positive development from my point of view uh, since the book came out six years ago. In terms of like very specific things that have happened, uh, you know, I mean, I, I I hear lots of anecdotal stories. Again, that this the book was focused on the local experience, things that ward members had control over. Um, some of those things have have kind of naturally adapted over the past six years. For instance. I talked a lot about the ratio of women's voices to men's voices in ward council meetings. And because of President Nelson's shifts with um, the high priest group and the young men's group and the ward mission leader, that balance um, is, is now, there's more parity in that balance and in those voices that are now in ward council. I think when I wrote the book, it was like 10 men and three women, and we still had bishopric meetings at that time. So there were meetings that were happening where no women were present. And now, of course, bishop meetings have been phased out and we have, um, you know, fewer men attending ward councils and we still have three women attending. So I think we'll get into this later because the research that's come out of BYU uh, from Chris Karpowitz and Je Jessica Priest and their colleagues um, is actually the research that I used while writing the book that some of Chris Karpowitz's earlier work really informed that analysis of the ward council dynamic. Um, so that has changed, but but there's still more to be done. Um, I have heard of lo lots of lots of great things, lots of people trying things, lots of you know sort of um, special meetings being held as to to talk about uh, additional ideas. Um, I've also heard some stories of things being shot down. So, for instance, I spoke recently uh, with a bishop who has a, has has been um, has called. Bishopric assistants uh, who are women. So he essentially has two counselors, male counselors and two female bishopric assistants. And the bishopric assistants are responsible for calling sacrament meeting speakers, making announcements. And, and you know, he's kind of come to peace with his local leadership about how he's doing that. But at first he definitely got called to task for, you know, having women essentially conduct meetings. Uh, sacrament meetings. So, you know, I think there's a push and a pull. We need people like him to be pushing that boundary um, uh, to show that these kinds of um, adaptations are, you know, net positives and um, are, are safe and kind of natural evolutions of what we're already doing. Um, and uh, and so I, I'm, I've been really heartened that even if, you know, right now it's not completely um, embraced by the larger church institution that people are experimenting with things like that. So we're seeing some, some experimentation, like you mentioned with this bishop member, or this bishop rather, who is calling some female assistants. We're seeing some experimentation at the local level to try to create some equity, to try to increase the value of, of women's participation uh, at this level. And really, like you mentioned, your book was geared towards um, the local ward level. Um, and so it's, it's, it's good, right? To be able to see some of these, yeah, some of I mean, these attempts. Of, to, to really get people to think imaginatively, right? Um, right. 
we 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 get so much in the in this vein of thinking that the instruction could should come from the top down uh and i think you know every ward is its own unique unit and has its own unique needs and is led by unique leaders and so the idea was just let's have some confidence and um to 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 you know really magnify the stewardship over the our particular uh area i mean it's actually also a great one of the great weaknesses of that local approach is that there is such variety in leadership and there is such variety in the way that the church is administered on the local level that immediately after the book came out i you know i was a little disheartened especially living here in utah like i heard about state presidents who you know were asking their Relief Society presidents and you know, women's presidents to sit up on the stand and you know do all of these things. We're holding special meetings with them and kind of making all these changes. And literally, the next stake over was was you know sort of batting down the hatches and and getting in getting more more severe and sort of um, uh, retrenching. Yeah. So I I think that you know where whereas we want to feel like we don't want the handbook to be three times larger, longer, right? But at the same time, we are wrestle, we wrestle with this idea that we are a lay church, we're a do-it-yourself church. Um, we have people in positions of authority who vary wildly from one stake to the neighboring stake on their vision for leadership and how they go about it. Yeah. So it depends on whether or not they read your book, right? Well, or if they were convinced <laughs> by it, or if they feel like it's even an need in their area. Right, right, right. Yeah, and that's what I've heard quite often uh, from so many, particularly male um, leaders, local leaders, is they just weren't even aware to ask these kinds of questions or to, to think of these types of issues. So it, it brought to their mind the kinds of questions that they really should be asking. And I will say one of the other disheartening things that happened after the book came out was um, the anecdotal evidence that I could not deny that um, in many cases, men who had read the book and who were in positions of authority tried to open the door to women in their congregations and invited a Relief Society president to attend bishop meetings or invited her to sit up mm -hmm. on the floor. And, and the amount of pushback those male leaders received from women was a fascinating repercussion that I hadn't fully anticipated. And um, the, the unwillingness, and I think I, you know, there's lots of ways we could talk about this more later too. But the unwillingness of women to um, to to embrace that greater opportunity for voice, influence, and visibility is really fascinating. There's a lot of reasons why they reacted that way um, that, that we could explore. That's that's absolutely fascinating. But what I will say is that in the six years since the book has come out, um, we've had we've had um, President Oscarson of the Young Women. Give a very pointed speech about how the young women are capable of more. They need more to do. They they need to participate more. We've had President Nelson repeatedly ask the women to step up. So so you I, I mean I've been very heartened by this directive from the top down that clearly s sort of you know sees the need to encourage women to embrace these leadership responsibilities. You know, I'm I'm sympathetic with women that don't want to or don't feel comfortable stepping forward. There is nothing in a young girl's experience in the church, certainly for my generation and older, that prepared her to speak up, be seen, and have influence at church. Right? We don't even fold chairs. Right? Um, so, so I I'm, I think I'm very I, I see where that comes from. Right? And we're very uncomfortable. We might talk about this later. We've been hearing reports lately that women are not even comfortable reading the sacrament prayers out loud, right? right? Even though they're in their canonical scripture, um, and so I, I'm very sympathetic to that. And there's this there's this sense of sort of power, ironic power that comes from rejecting power, right? So, so I'm I'm fascinated by that. But at the same time, I do see our leaders asking them to step up. The problem I see is that there's nothing necessarily for them to step up to, right? For, for men, it's a very clear cut. You have the keys to um, officiate in priesthood ordinances, right? You have the, the authority to um, preside and to 
administer priesthood blessings and to um, administer saving ordinances, right? And so there's very concrete, tangible needs for men in the church. And when we ask women to step up, are we saying bring more pastorals? Are we saying tend to your family more? Are we saying, you know, what are we saying? Are, just be a good minister, right? So I I really think that what I would love to see from a from an institutional global point of view is for us to solve this problem of what does it mean for women to step up? Like, okay, President Nelson, I am there. I'm totally thrilled to be asked to do that. But what does it mean? And what is my job? And and for men in the church, they're conditioned very early on for that to be a very, you know, I can check this box. I can pass this comment or I don't. I can give a priesthood blessing or I can't, right? And for women, it's it's a blank page and they have to define what that is for themselves. And that can be very frustrating and overwhelming. So you've been addressing this, but uh, what are, are there other areas that you think still need to be addressed at this point? Yeah, I mean, um, yes. <laughs> so. Yeah, I mean, I'm, pra I'm phrasing that poorly. There are obviously areas that still need to be addressed. I guess what I'd like to ask is, can you can you talk about a few of those that are sort of top yeah. of your mind? So I'll go back to my three areas of, um, of my three metrics, my three standards. I don't want to say my three critiques, but that it's, it's like, it, what can we look at and ha and what strategically can we focus on addressing? And it's visibility, um, influence, uh, and I just forgot, what was it? <laughs> That's my last one, uh, voice. Visibility of influence and voice. So um, when we look at those three things and we apply the, that lens on the Sunday experience, um, we have major holes. So I'll tell you an anecdote. So I have a 16 year old daughter, I have three daughters and a 16 year old who um, has struggled with gender issues in the church ever since I can remember. And I am the kind of person who actively did not try to impose my particular views on my daughters. I wanted them to grow up having a magical Mormon experience. Um, and to come to these things on their own. But she came to it on her own very early. And so I find myself being in a very defensive position with her and saying, oh, you know, I know that bothers you, but here's why it's okay, you know, which is a position I never thought I'd really be in, but it's really fascinating. And so one night, my husband and I, she was ranting, really, really upset. Like, why can't I do anything? Why are the boys in my ward passing the sacrament when I don't even, you know, think they're as worthy as I am, that kind of thing. And my husband and I said to her, you know, in the temple, women uh, administer pre priesthood ordinances and um, officiate in those, in those rituals. And we have priesthood power given to us, um, you know, by virtue of our, our, our covenants. And, um, and we kept saying, you know, in the temple, in the temple, you see this. And she looked at us completely seriously and she said, I do not believe you. And we're like, well, we're telling you this. Why aren't you believing it? She said, there's nothing in my Sunday experience that would lead me to believe that women officiate and administer in the church. And I thought that was fascinating because when we think about the experience that our you know, children up until temple age, uh, which some of them may not even have, temple, you know, ordinance age or that experience, um, there is nothing in their Sunday experience that uh, shows them women having ecclesiastical power. We, you know, it's very common in my ward, especially because I have a male organist um, and a male music, uh, con a, con a male conductor, that there will be no women on our stand. And it's, and, and every once in a while, there will be no women on the program. Right. Um, and so there is no time in our youth's experience where there are all women on the program um, or all women on the stand. And so when we talk about voice influence and, and vis visibility, for my daughter to go to church on Sunday and see a woman in a role of ecclesiastical authority, even if she's sitting on the stand you know, silently like a bishopric member who isn't conducting that day, right? 
something up there, we cannot underestimate how important that is for our youth. Uh, it's As I say, it said in the book, church is the only place in these kids' lives these days where they are told that they cannot do something because of their gender. And we have to recognize how profoundly that's influencing them. And so I, if I had to say anything, I would say, you know, again, we have to look at the visibility of what's happening on Sunday. And some people might say, that, well, that's really superficial. Who cares what I see when I'm sitting in sacrament meeting? Visibility is something that, um, that has powerful, you know, psychic influence. And what I, I just like throwing this idea out there to see if anybody is listening. But, you know, what I would love to see is I would love to see a division between presiding and conducting. And if you have the bishopric presiding, then it opens up the conducting of the meeting to the elders quorum who have stewardship over the men and the Relief Society presidents who have stewardship over the women. And you can share that conducting responsibility jointly between the elders quorum leadership and the Relief Society leadership and have them, one from each, up on the stand each week. And you could rotate so everybody doesn't have to be separated from their family all the time. But if you have one month where the Relief Society is responsible for conducting sacrament meeting, you could have the elders quorum presidency responsible for conducting sacrament meeting the next month, but you'd have some sort of cooperative relationship between the men and the women in the ward. And you'd have the leaders who have stewardship over the ward um, doing that conducting. So, you know, I think, I think that's something that has to come from the top down in order to really be uh, fully, you know, not, not, somebody just going rogue, be fully sanctioned. But but I think looking at things like that, um, are, are they're more critical than we might think. Yeah, I totally agree that visibility is so important. We're seeing that also in the entertainment industry, right? And seeing representation um, within the entertainment industry and how that has a huge effect on uh, young girls who have never seen a superhero that uh, looks like them before exactly. as, as always or or those of you know of uh that aren't white right people of color so, yeah. seeing that kind of representation so yeah i think uh that's and again our our kids are getting bombarded with those messages and they're buying right. into them they're believing them they're seeing the positive proof from them and you know the institution that they should be holding most dear is not doing that so right Right. Well, let's get to some viewer comments, uh, if you don't mind here, and we'll see what, if we can get through a few of the uh, questions that have been posed. Um, so I'm going to go to scrolling up towards the top. Brian Ladle, and I, I apologize if I'm mispronouncing your name. Uh, he asks, what do you think of the recent emphasis in conference on the concept of presiding, particularly the, and he says, unwelcome for me, reminders that men preside in the home and women only preside in the absence of a man? Yeah. Okay. Um, I grew up in a single mother home. Um, my mother, you know, was, was a very active, devout member and, um, it was just the two of us. So, you know, I, I, I'm very, I have very complex feelings about this because, um, it just, I just didn't, I don't have a living testimony of that. Right. Um, we had, we had a sacred, a sacred home and my mother was an incredible example of, um, spiritual power. Uh, I, I, I think, I think maybe one of the things that, you know, if it, I, I'd like to generously, um, um, interpret this as maybe a stem of this recent division that, that Elder Oaks offered between a sort of family priesthood and a church priesthood. Um, there is an, there's a book that came out several months ago by a woman named Barbara Morgan, who was the first female institute director in the church in the Cambridge Institute in Massachusetts. And she, her, her book sort of tries to parse out this home priesthood and church priesthood um, and, and say that they're different. They have different um, areas of authority. There's different balances. And in my mind, you know, what her book is actually doing is saying that in the home there is more parity. Uh, and so I don't quite understand, you know, why we would go back to this male presiding model. Um, but but I, I, I have seen this idea, especially in Elder Oaks' talk recently, the last conference, 
this idea of parsing out home authority with um, church authority. Um, I, I, I think this, like this concept of priesthood authority is getting kind of is very, is more convoluted than usual right now, because we see some of our leaders, both male and female, uh, talking about priesthood as the opportunity to work in God's name, right? And we have some very clear direction, like do not refer to the boys who are passing the sacrament as the priesthood, right? Mm -hmm. And we have, for instance, President Jean Bingham uh, recently talked about how she has priesthood authority, which was amazing, right? To have a general officer of the church talk about how she has priesthood authority. One thing that I think, but, but, but I think one of the problems with that is that we're almost replacing the word priesthood authority for women with what used to be called revelation or gifts, you know, promptings of the spirit. Right. I, have, I have a relationship with God. I have the opportunity to receive revelation and be his hands on earth, right? And no one's saying that women don't have that opportunity, but it just used to be called having spirit, right? And now Sister Bingham's calling it having priesthood authority. So I'm not complaining. Like, I think that's a great step, but I still think there's just this massive confusion about like, what is the priesthood? Small P, capital P, like, you know, authority, power, keys, like what's the difference? And, and I do think Barbara Morgan's book does a great job of starting to parse that out. But on the other hand, I wish it weren't so complicated that we need like scholarly books to help us figure it out, right? Right. Um, so, right. yeah. So moving on here, um, Cheryl Bruno makes a comment here, or asks a question rather, and I think we're going to get to this later, so we can maybe just make a quick comment on this. I'm wondering what Nyland thinks about women who are blessing or assisting with the sacrament in their coronavirus home churches. Um, any quick comments on that? Because I think we're going to address that later. Yeah, I mean, I'm happy to, to say a few words about that now. We are going to, that is a whole other section, I know. But um, yeah, I think, um, um, for me, with three daughters, home church has totally blown gender expectations around the sacrament out of the water, right? My daughters are conducting our meetings. My husband says the prayer on the bread and the water, but my daughters literally are, you know, picking it up and carrying it around. They're making a very deliberate show of doing that. <laughs> um, and so, I mean, I have a very traditional, very ideal family situation. Um, you know, I have, uh, I'm married to a, a husband who's an active priesthood holder, and I have children at home who are old enough to understand what we're doing and participate, right? I get that it's the absolute ideal situation. Um, and in that situation, we, we have, broken down that the formality of those those gender constructs that define the ordinance um, and really boiled it down to this very simple and but meaningful action. Um, Jana Reese uh, posted a really fascinating article in the religious news service uh, today quoting uh, is it okay to get into this a little bit? Yeah, please go right ahead quoting the just instruction that came from the church officially about the sacrament and the official instruction said in unusual circumstances when the sacrament is not available members can be comforted by studying the sacrament pairs and recommitting to li live the covenants her what she does through graphs and analysis and she has you know very unique uh, access to uh, recent statistics from her own survey and book is she looks at the number of women in the church who actually fall under unusual circumstances. And she concludes through very, you know, very logical parsing out that 60% um, <clears throat> of um, Latter-day Saint women fall under unusual circumstances, meaning that they are either not married uh, or, and that includes never have been married, widowed, divorced, et cetera, and they are not currently married. Um, and it includes a group that uh, is married but does not have an uh, an LDS or active spouse, and so that get that leaves um, uh, that leaves you know about just over a third 
of LDS women who are in situations like mine, where I'm, you know, I'm married with an active spouse. Um, and so her point is, you know, we can't call that an unusual circumstance. That is the church. Um, and, and she, you know, very point, pointedly says um, at the end of her article, you know, um, withdrawing the sacrament from my life was not intended to be a punishment, but it sure feels like one sometimes. So, you know, that's, that's a, that's a, a really painful uh, lesson that we're, we're in right now. And um, there've been, there's also been some, some commentary about this idea that that's being pr promoted quite often on the, on the general level, that even if women do not officiate in ritual ordinances, we still receive all the blessings of the priesthood. And that's a, it's a beautiful sentiment and, and very true in many ways. But what is not being counted is that, for instance, this is a very real, very tangible way in which two thirds of the women of the church are not full participants in the blessings of the priesthood. Um, and that's not even starting to talk about the blessings that come from just being able to serve people as a priesthood holder, right? That, that, that men exclusively have that, that, and that blessing is off, off limits to women as well. So I, I just think, you know, this, I would love for this particular situation uh, that we're in to, to really help us break down um, the, the sacrament uh, and the, the Sunday, as I mentioned, this whole sacrament meaning experience with those, that lens of visibility, voice and, and impact, influence. We're definitely gonna circle back around to this um, a little bit later because this is something that has been top of my mind and uh, a huge concern for me as well. Um, I'm just gonna take one more comment here and then we'll move along uh, with what we've planned for tonight. And this is from Rick C. Bennett. Uh, he says, does Nyland get pushback from both orto Orthodox folks telling her that she is studying the ark as well as liberal folks saying she doesn't go far enough and should advocate for ordaining women. It's like, it's like the story of my life. And I'm really <laughs> proud. Of, I'm really proud of that. Um, that's exactly where I want to be because that's where most of the members of the church are. And it was really scary, you know, 10 years ago to be entering this conversation and be told on the one hand that I was naive and a shell of the brethren and all this stuff. And then on the other hand, be told I was an apostate and, all that. And it was really disconcerting at first and um, very shaking. And I just, I love that position now because it means that um, I'm speaking up on behalf of the middle ground, which is massive. It's massive. And it took me a while to gain confidence um, in the size of that group and how much that group appreciates having a voice. But I just think, you know, in, in every public discourse, you have the edges dominating. Um, and it's really hard for people to feel like they have to choose one side or another. And um, with the gospel, that doesn't always work because you have people who are in you know, a body and soul committed to it, but they're still actively critiquing their experience, right? Yeah. And, um, and I think that, you know, we we've suffered um, over the past decade from people who felt like they did have to pick one side or the other, right? And I right. think we've done a lot of, a much better job over the past decade of, of crafting that space in the middle to say, I'm not going anywhere and I don't have to go anywhere. Um, right. right. To make this my own. Yeah. Yeah. I've, I've often joked that it takes both people uh, quietly whispering from the inside as well as people shouting from the megaphones from the outside in order to get people talking. Right. Yeah. Um, all right. So let's go ahead and move forward here. So you were recently a guest on the Mormonland podcast uh, with Peggy Fletcher Stack and David Noyce. And you were discussing a lot of the topics that we're covering tonight. Um, and while I don't want to repeat that interview, I would like to expand on just a few items that were brought up in it. Uh, at one point in the conversation, you mentioned that some women are hesitant to even utter the words of sacrament meeting now or sacrament blessing. You said that just a few minutes ago as well. It strikes me as just a little unsettling that even reading aloud the words of the sacrament communion, which, as you pointed out, are canonical, they're in our doctrine and covenants, uh, could make women feel uncomfortable. Can we talk about the implications of that a little bit and um, how deeply tied to gender ritual seems to be in the church? Yeah, um, I think... You know, going back to my the anecdote of my daughter, I do think that 
um, for those who have not gone through the temple, um, and even for those who have, that idea of um, of women officiating in in an, in an ordinance like that um, is very uncomfortable. We, you know, the one of the wonderful things about women in in the early church that I look at often is is the hundred year history of women giving healing blessings. Now these were not, you know, Melchizedek priesthood, um, and, you know, anointings but they were healing blessings um, to which some women were officially set apart as their calling and getting back to that idea that I mentioned earlier about um, women having some very specific ecclesiastical role, right? This was an ecclesiastical role that um, women in the early church, you know, thrilled to embrace. And the phasing out of, of healing, giving healing blessings took a hundred years. I think sometimes we think about, oh, that was something that like, that pioneer lady did on her son after Hans Mill massacre and over her oxen or whatever. No, like it was going strong into the 20th century. And the history of how that was phased out is very interesting. Um, it really was around the wars and, um, and uh, anyway, um, I just, I think that, you know, looking at, looking at, that example is the one is is something that a lot of women get very excited about because we can kind of you know sink our teeth into this idea that that women blessed pregnant women before they gave birth like there was a job for them there was a purpose for them there was a ritualistic place for them um and then we get to today where you know and i i just i learned about that just on on facebook conversations where people were saying oh i don't i don't even feel comfortable saying the prayers out loud. Um, and so I think, you know, we have to look at how ingrained and how deep seated that understanding is that ritual administration is um, the male office, right? And there's really um, very little reason to think otherwise. Again, the temple can be an exception. It's a powerful exception. It's a really important exception. Uh, but again, like, you know, for my daughter or for many, many women in the church, uh, that's not part of their lived regular experience in the church. I'm, I'm just going to give a quick anecdote from my own experience. I was um, back when we had uh, gospel. Um, oh my goodness. Now I'm forgetting the name of it. Uh, it was the sort of the, the intro level Sunday school class. Yeah. Gospel oh. principles. There we are. Uh, back when we had a gospel principles uh, class, I taught it for quite a while. And um, I, when we would talk about the topic of the sacrament, I would always ask a woman to read the prayers. Um, usually two women, one for, you know, the, the bread and one for the wine slash water. And, and yeah, it, it always did feel like there was a bit of like um, static in the room, I guess you could say, right? A little, a little like, can we do this? <laughs> you know? And, and, and I would always comment that it was lovely to hear that in the voice of a woman. Um, afterwards. And then a lot of times people would say, you know, I, I guess it never really dawned on me that, yeah. you know, it's that we don't hear it in the voice of a woman. Um, and then likewise, I had also brought up healing blessings one particular Sunday and, uh, and women performing them in the early church. And there were, uh, there were, there was a couple, I remember sitting in the back of um, the class and the husband started tearing up and, uh, Afterwards, he came up to me and he told me, and this is actually choking me up thinking about this. Um, he told me that he had the journals of his great grandmother who goes back in pioneer history. And um, for years, he and other family members were ashamed of those journals because she talks about giving blessings and yeah. they thought that she was a heretic. And yes had no idea that this was a, a, uh, an accepted practice. They just thought that great grandma was out in the cornfield. Wow. <laughs> so, wow. so, she, so he said that I really was able by bringing that up to, to resolve a long going family issue um, where they always felt like they had to hide, you know, great grandma's yeah. blessings that she used to give. So I think that this is, you know, I, I it surprises me anymore that there are, those members of the church, both men and women, who weren't aware of that. Um, it seems like information has been pretty clear on that 
you know, for over the past five, 10 years, but still, you know, we don't, we, we don't exactly embrace reading a whole lot of historical scholarship either. So, <laughs> um, small let me, thing. Let me, I'll just say one more thing. It's a really, really yeah. small thing, but, um, the audio version of the scriptures, you can choose your narrator, your reader. I don't know if people are aware of this, but you can have a woman read the scriptures to you. And actually, even for me, like when I selected that and was listening to my scriptures on my phone, it kind of like, it was kind of shaking. It shook me up yeah. a little bit, like the first time it happened. Um, so anyway. That's a really good exercise. Here, yeah. narrator is reading Doctrine and Covenants. <laughs> you can hear it in a female voice there Great. in the actual of scripture uh, <laughs> official podcast app. I mean. So we talked about um, President Oaks's talk a little bit earlier, and you'd also talked about this in the Mormon Land interview that you did uh, in the most recent April 2020 conference. The talk was titled The Melchizedek Priesthood and the Keys, and um, Oaks makes some statements in the talk that were of particular relevance to women, um, and the differentiating sort of the functions of the priesthood, like you said, in the, in the church versus priesthood in the home. Um, I pulled a few quotes, if you don't mind me just reading those off and then we'll respond to those. Uh, so President Oaks clarified that priesthood is not those who have been ordained to an office. Uh, he said, we shouldn't be referring to ordained men as the priesthood, which you brought up earlier as well. Uh, and we've also heard that from other church leaders um, as well. He continued, holders of the various offices of the Aaronic priesthood officiate in the ordinances of the sacrament under the keys and direction of the bishop who holds the keys of the Aaronic priesthood. The same principle applies to the priesthood ordinances in which women officiate in the temple. Um, though women do not hold an office in the priesthood, they perform sacred temple ordinances under the authorization of the president of the temple who holds the keys for the ordinances of the temple. Um, so, I mean, we're getting some direct language about women holding priesthood uh, or exercising the priesthood in, in the temple. He added, by being set apart leaders, which includes women in this case, exercise priesthood authority in their callings. And then President Oaks switched to the home setting, stating that priesthood power and priesthood authority function differently in the church than in the family. And he added, uh, the same principles of authority applies when a father's absent and mother is the family leader. She presides in her home and is instrumental in bringing the power and blessings of the priesthood into her family through her endowment and sealing in the temple. While she's not authorized to give the priesthood blessings. Yes, so, so that's when every woman I know thought he was going to say, surprise, now with right. home church, you get to <laughs> bless <Right>. your apartment. <laughs> yes, I can, I can imagine scores of women sitting closer to the edge of their seat. Yeah. <laughs> right, as he's saying this. <laughs> While she's not authorized to give the priesthood blessing that can be given only by a person holding a certain office in the priesthood, she can perform all of the other functions of family leadership uh, in doing so. And that's, and you know, maybe we can parse that out. All the other functions of family leadership. I mean, are we talking about councils? Like, you know, <laughs> when you sit down and interview your children, worthiness interviews? <laughs> I don't know. In doing so, she exercises the power of the priesthood for the benefit of the children over whom she presides in her position of leadership in the family. So I guess my my broad question is, is what, what are some of the implications of Oak's talk uh, for women? And can we start with his statement of exercising priesthood authority and callings in the temple? We've we discussed this earlier, uh, but is there anything more that you would like to to add to that? Well, um, as as I mentioned, I think I think President Oaks was picking up some of those themes that Barbara Morgan is exploring in um, her recent book, with which is the division of priesthood in the home versus the the use of um, keys and and authority in the church administration. Um, I have never really understood the division of power in the home. And maybe that's because I grew up with just a mom. But um, I think the division of power in the home is so dependent on personality and dynamic of the relationship and what kind of kids you're dealing with. Like, it's, I just don't know any families where it's that formalized. And so I guess I've never really understood, like, 
what does preside in the home mean? Well, we should be doing all of these things together, shouldn't we? Like, are, are people, are parents really making um, unilaterally, you know, sort of, I, I, I I have a, I, and I, I'm very curious, like, I'm curious, like, how does that, how does fatherly presiding in the home look for a home that's really doing what Elder Oaks is imagining? Um, if it's some sort of authoritarian, like, okay, this is who's going to pray now, and this is what you should, you know, be doing, and this is, uh, is, it, is it more than just calling everybody to scripture study? Is it more than just saying, hey, kid, will you say the prayer on the dinner tonight? Like, I, <laughs> I'm genuinely curious because in my home, that's what it is. My husband and I look at each other and we're like, whose turn is it to pray? Mm, okay, you, you, you know, that kid. Um, so uh, I, I just, I've never had that experience of having that formally practiced in my home. And I don't want that experience. Like, it seems very anathema to everything else that we're told about the marital unit, like you're supposed to be equal. You're supposed to make decisions together, but there's somebody presiding. Like, I, and I think it's been generations of women that have been confused by that. Uh, and I, and I don't, I don't, it, it doesn't, it, I don't have a lived real reality that helps me understand what president Oaks is saying. And I don't know really anybody who does. And so I think every time that message is reiterated, I feel more and more confused. Um, so I'm very, I'm very curious. I would love um, to learn about how how um, a breakdown works without one person being in charge of the other, and with us being able to preside, but also be equal partners and make decisions together. Yeah, and then on behalf of of I mean, there's you know single mothers in particular is, is who he's referring to more so than single women. Um, exercising the power of the priesthood for the benefit of the children over whom she presides. Yeah, I mean, um, I, I've often talked about my mom, and the interesting thing is Elder, Elder Oaks grew up with a single mom too, right? But like, I often talk about with my own mom, like, you know, she, she, I mean, she did, she pulled down the powers of heaven, like she was a great spiritual powerhouse. And, you know, she said a prayer the morning I left the college that was you know, a matriarchal blessing. That's that's all it was. Like, there's no other way to describe yeah. it, right? And so yeah. I just don't know what would have been different. I mean, yeah. we had home teachers who we asked for blessings at the beginning of every school year, which was awesome. But, yeah. You know. Yeah. So let's just get, take a couple of comments here and then we'll move on to uh, switch topics to talk about um, the home church uh, situation. Um, so a couple of questions here, one from Paige Kelly. She says, may I ask, Nylan, did you receive your courage to be a clear, measured, inspire vo inspired voice for this topic in our faith? How have you gained the courage to move beyond any potential label that you may receive among our faith community to share these ideas more broadly? Where does this courage come from and how does it stay with you? <laughs> um that's a great question. I um, I usually go Sounds back- Sounds like your mother had something to do yeah, with those two. <laughs> I mean, two major influences in my life. I grew up in New York City. Um, I, I was the only child of um, divorced parents. Uh, my dad was an official, like not a member. I mean, he, my dad was technically baptized um, soon after my parents married, but he, he wasn't active. Um, and my mom, so- um, yeah, my mom was just an amazing example. My mom was very unusual because she was uh, an international professional. She was a performing a, an opera singer. And so she, from my earliest memories, are her being embraced by the institutional church, meaning by the 12 apostles, by the prophet himself, by our local leadership to represent the church in a very public way. She literally had a voice. She literally had a voice. <laughs> and I've talked a lot about how, you know, um, even when we've been in periods in the church's history when we're not encouraging women to be highly educated or to be participating in public life or in um, professional, the professional uh, sphere, we always make an exception for artists because their talent is so obviously God-given. I mean, you know, not we kind of forget that it actually takes 
hundreds of thousands of hours to, to work on that talent. But your talent is so obvious and God given that they get a special pass. And that's what happened to my mom. Like we did missionary videos. We sang at President Hinckley's birthday parties. We traveled to Israel to sing with President Hinckley. Like it was just this love fest. And I was right in the middle of that. And, it, and we do firesides. We recorded albums. We sang at temple dedications. Like, and so, you know, and so it was partly that partly my mom's personality. She honestly just didn't care. Like she loved the church body and soul and didn't care what anybody said about her particular brand of, of Mormonism. Right. So there was all of that. There, there was another major Im impact uh, influence in my life, which is the fact that I went to an all girls school for 13 years. So I went to a private girls school on the Upper East Side of New York, uh, of Manhattan. And um, so there, while I was being taught in my Manhattan ward and young women that family and motherhood was really important. And I was seeing at home how much my mom loved being my mother and wanted a bigger family and wasn't able to get that and saw that as, a, as an aspiration. I needed to go be the first female president, right? Um, and so for me, those messages really worked well together. Um, and a really important thing that came out of my um, girls' education experience was that I recognized the importance of um, female spaces. So, you know, when, and I think this is one of the things that helps me be a good advocate in the church is that um, I loved being with just women and I just girls. And it was really, really important to my um development of my voice to be with just girls and women. And so I don't want to take that away from anybody. And so I'm, I'm not a sameness person. Like I'm not saying that all barriers need to be broken down because the Relief Society is something really, really special. Um, I think it's kind of um, bogged down and buried. And I think, you know, I, this term excavated is being, you know, is, is very, feels very right, that it needs to be excavated, it's power, it's a potential. Um, but I'm not a, let's just, you know, sort of break everything and start over kind of person um, because of that experience, so. Um, Excellent. Yeah. Excellent. Thanks for your personal insight there. Um, and I think that Siri is about to, there we go. <laughs> Siri was just about to ask me what I wanted. Oh. <laughs> She's going to cut into the conversation. All right. So let's go ahead and talk about home church a little bit here. And this is another topic that was brought up in the Mormon land interview. Um, and you guys talked about a few documents that were recently published uh, by the church regarding the administration of ordinances during this time of pandemic and uh, church meeting closures. Um, the first document was titled Administrative Principles in Challenging Times. And um, let me just quote some of the article here. Uh, many ordinances require the laying on of hands, such as confirmations, ordinations, blessings, setting apart, and conferring of priesthood keys. Such ordinances require that the priesthood holder who performs the ordinance must be in the same location as the recipient. Priesthood ordinances cannot be performed remotely using technology. When circumstances require, others may observe the ordinance remotely using technology if authorized by the presiding authority. So before we move to the next document, what are your thoughts on these guidelines and what they might mean for women? I'm thinking particularly of things like baby blessings, where uh, which would require the infant to be held while being blessed. And if you've got a situation where a baby blessing is perhaps being conducted in a home with a mother and father, and the other participants are joining in via Zoom uh, from other locations. Any thoughts on this? Um, I mean, I think uh, I think one of the things that this pandemic has done is emphasize the physicality of our rituals and ordinances and blessings. Um, you know, I, I I have this theory that you know one of the reasons we 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 talk often about the need to have a body. And that having a body is a gift um, because we have experiences in this life um, and we suffer pain and we suffer joy and pleasure in ways that we couldn't experience without a body. Um, I, I have to think that there's also something critical about our 
flesh and blood body when it comes to rituals because ordinances are their physical communions uh, between people, right? Um, it's, uh, or with an object. In the case of the sacrament, it's with the bread and water that acquires holy significance. It acquires some sort of sacred significance when it's properly blessed. And I mean, you think about all of our ordinances, you know, water, we interact with a, a natural element. Um, in the temple, you, 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 ha you have to interact with other people, right? You, 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 you touch other people. Um, and it's that, that union that kind of creates that sacred bond um, and seals that, that covenant. So, um, so I, I personally think it's a very beautiful thing that we have to use these bodies that are unique to our experience here on earth in order to perform rituals that are unique to this earth as well. And that, you know, everybody needs to pass through that physical experience, even if vicariously. So for me, like, I, I, I like the idea of preserving that, um, the sacred nature of that physical experience. Um, and I, yeah, I mean, that's not to say, that's not to say that I don't think it, there's value in performing these things virtually, but I don't know. I, I feel like for me personally, like I, I'm, I'm sympathetic to this idea that we need to protect that, that, personal in-person experience. I also feel it's a little bit strange and a little bit um, contrasting with the way that we've received instruction not to hold Zoom meetings, right? Um, this has been something that's been going back and forth for, for a couple months now, where you know ordinances need to be done in person um, because you need the connection of other people, but we're not supposed to have the connection of other people in our dialogue and in our verbal worship. Because the way we worship as Mormons is by talking, right? I mean, we talk, we give talks, we talk some more, we have meetings, like, um, so it's just been really interesting to see all of that stripped away without, and, and not even be participating in virtual talking. Um, so I've been fascinated by that. And I, and I think the reason for that may be this emphasis on home church, right? That this is a unique opportunity to foster the spirit in our homes, to train ourselves, to have integrity and do the things that we say we're supposed to do to read our scriptures and to really search and ponder and pray in the privacy of our homes and, and do what we say we're going to do um, independent of any community pressure or structure, right? And I think President Nelson, since introducing the home church company concept, has also, you know, really emphasized that idea of integrity. And that goes hand in hand with home church, right? If you're you're saying you're doing these things and then when push comes to shove and nobody's watching, you're really not, then then you know, that's a problem. And I think maybe they're seeing this as an opportunity to really challenge us to do to, you know, walk walk the walk and not just talk the talk. A thought came to my mind when we were talking about um, the physicality of ordinances and of blessings. And a thought came to my mind of not not to push back on this, because I agree with you that I think, you know, as, as most churches would refer to them as sacraments. Right. And I think that the sac sacraments tend to be um, by nature, tend to be physical. And there's a reason for that. Right. It's it's part of the experience of transformation. Right. And so, but I did think of there is at least three instances in the New Testament where Jesus healed remotely, right? Where you had the centurion official who came up to him and asked about his servant and and Jesus healed him from afar. And you had the uh what was it, the um the Phoenician woman and her daughter, uh, who she believed was uh possessed by a devil, right? Yeah. And Jesus cast out the devil from afar. I'm sure there's probably others, but <laughs> so that's a really great point. And that's a really fascinating point. Like I have a friend who's LDS who just became um, certified in Reiki healing, you know, and, yeah. and that's, like a, I mean, it's a fascinating concept that, you know, there's something about the laying on of hands essentially that can heal. But, but you're right. Like I, I am familiar with other people, other 
people who I believe exercise spiritual power and spiritual healing gifts that could do it remotely and do do it remotely. And right. what's a what's a prayer like except you know a request to to change a petition, a petition right? Remote remote petition. Yeah. Yeah. Fascinating. So the other document that was released by the church was titled Directions for Essential Ordinances, Blessings, and Other Church Functions. And I was just going to read uh, a couple of quick sections from that document. Number one was administering to the sick. And it said a priesthood blessing requires the physical laying on of hands. Normally, two or more Melchizedek priesthood holders administer, but one may do it alone. Uh, after taking every necessary precaution, when conditions prohibit placing hands on a person's head, a prayer can be offered, including using technology. Um, I think that sort of alludes to what we're talking about here, um, that the administration of the blessing is is typically done with hands-on, but if this if conditions, it says prohibit placing hands on a person's head, then a prayer can be offered, including using technology. Um, I guess the difference is, is the the formality of administering a priesthood blessing versus a prayer being offered on behalf. I don't know. Do you have any comments on that? Just that I think this whole situation is kind of forcing us to ask ourselves, like, what is it about that actual physical communion yeah. that makes it feel good, right? Um, that yeah. changes the bread and water into something more than bread and water, right? That, yeah. that changes a person's body into something that's more whole um i i don't know i just think that's really fascinating but um but there's i think you know i i, I think there's something that is that our leader trying to preserve in that physical interaction that takes it across the line from being just a petition or just a, a you know an act of faith or hope and actually turns it into something that yeah divine a, a, a ritual right or a right right interesting um so the second section i wanted to read was uh titled administering the sacrament and it says members may provide their own bread and water however preparing the sacrament should be done by authorized priesthood holders uh the priesthood holders says and, and this is important it says holder and then parentheses s so singular or uh, you can have, you know, one or two, one or more. The priesthood holder or holders administering the sacrament must be in the same location as those who receive it when they break the bread, say the prayers, and pass the emblems. In unusual circumstances, when the sacrament is not available, members can be comforted by studying the sacrament prayers and recommitting to live the covenant members have made and praying for the day that they will receive it again in person properly administered by the priesthood. This gets back to what Jana Reese. Yeah, this uh, was the section she quoted. Right, right. Um, that last line that I just read in particular really stands out to me. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, particularly where single women are concerned. Um, my mother, if I can just give you a personal story, she's she's been divorced since I was a child. And um, she's a devout member of the church. Um, she doesn't have priesthood to bless the sacrament for her. She lives alone. Um, however, taking the sacrament weekly is a deeply meaningful practice for her. And uh, while it may be a little unorthodox, what she's been doing is offering a prayer of gratitude and then taking the emblems um, on, uh, you know, on her own. Um, and she asked me if this was okay. And I don't know how to respond, but I have to believe that we have a generous God and a loving uh, God who understands the circumstances. So I'm not saying that I'm encouraging this as a standard practice, but on the other hand, um, I think that the, the, sim the simpleness of faith and devotion has to count for something. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think that's I think that's very beautiful. I think what we're weighing here, the equation is, is what your mother's doing a net negative or is it a net neutral, right? Because we're told that it's not the net positive, like it's not having the full sacred effect. Okay, fine. But it's not a net negative. Like there's, 
you know, it, there's no lightning bolt coming down and striking her. Like it's not, I don't know, making her sick or causing her to lose her blessings or anything, right? And so I I guess that's what I'm wrestling with most. If we if we, we take off the table for a moment the, the idea that, you know, these these single women could be saying the prayers and blessing it themselves. So if we take that off the table and we look at what your mom is doing, I mean, that's such a beautiful expression of faith and of reminding herself of what that ritual will mean for her when, when she gets back to it. Um, and, and so it feels like it's a, it's a net positive in its own way, right? It's not, it's not anything that's detracting. Um, and so I wonder, you know, I have to ask myself, like, what are we afraid of in that situation with your mother? Like, you, you know, if somebody does object to that, what are they afraid of? Are they afraid that is devaluing the power and impact of the priesthood authority overseeing that ritual? Probably, that is probably the fear. Um, but, but I don't know. In my mind, it's it's very beautiful, and it, it's it's it, there's there's no there's no um, there's nothing negative to doing that. Yeah, and you know, I, in in my mother's case, and I would think for many uh, women as well, it's not done with in malicious intent, right? It's not done as a uh, as a way to show up the priesthood or uh, you know to to try to like you said break down barriers. It's it's done with a sincere intent to express faith and and something that's very meaningful yeah. to them. So yeah, I think that. It's definitely an interesting time for asking these kinds of questions, right? I mean, maybe Spe they, yeah. Go ahead. I was going to say, speaking of which, I mean, you've been hearing quite a few stories, so I, you know, of how this is going for for women. Um, I mean, can you share some with us? How is it going? Is it frustrating? Well, is it empowering? Is it a mix? Um, for some, I've heard that they re that um, one woman that I know who lives on her own. Um, actually is, is very grateful that she needs other people to uh, administer the sacrament because it forces her to interact with people, right? I think she said that she was, she's been pairing up with um, a neighboring family or I guess maybe her minister or something like that um, to, you know, to have them visit and, and offer a proper sacrament each week. And so she's really appreciated that, right? Because it kind of demands that she interact and, and worship with with other people which of course she's missing generally um but having been on her own for you know two three months now so there's definitely that um and yeah i mean i think i think at the end of the day it's a very personal and a very private thing and i you know back to the to what we were just saying earlier i i mean i think another one of the fears around um, sort of empowering uh, women who are alone in, in this ritual is that, um, you know, we might not need each other as much anymore. Uh, that is one of the beautiful elements of um, our priesthood rituals is that they, they do re all require other people, right? Um, and so so there is that that communal element that's really um, that's really precious. And if we are all just completely self-sufficient um, and not needing each other, then that, that starts to break down the idea of communal salvation that's really at the heart of our rituals. But I don't know, I'd love to hear more more stories of, of what women are doing in these circumstances. Do you have um, on, on your, uh, any of your websites on mormonwomen.com, do you have uh, a section where women can write in and talk about some of their experiences during this time? Yeah, actually. Um, so I actually am not the active editor of the Mormon Women Project at this moment. And so I'll present that to the editors. That's a really great idea. I know they 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 do wonderful um, interview series uh, based on specific topics. So they, in the past, they've done um, end of childbearing years, for instance. They've done stories on um, marriages in which, you know, the husband is not a member of the church, mixed faith marriages. And right now they're doing one on the impact of the Book of Mormon. And so this is another really fascinating one. Like yeah. how did you, how did you handle Corona as a, right. as a woman? You know. I would think that at, even from just an oral history standpoint, yeah. 
yeah. that this could be some pretty valuable information. I mean, now we are, you know, we're looking back at the Spanish flu uh, epidemic. Um, Artist Partial on her excellent blog, Keep a Pitching In, has been, right, posting, uh, and also on her social media channels, the Who We Lost series that yeah. she's that she's doing. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I could I could think that in the future, these types of discussions could be really important yeah. um, for people. Um, I'm gonna just take a quick brief uh, look at comments here real quick, and then we're gonna just skip ahead a little bit because we are running somewhat over time, but I wanna get to our third topic. Um, let's see. Oh yeah, this is, this is interesting. So commenting on the idea of um, remote healings again, um, Cheryl Bruno adds, healing remotely, was that Joseph Smith who healed by giving his handkerchief to someone to take home with them? I, are you familiar with that piece of yeah. church history? Yeah, that's, the that's interesting. The church history museum? I yeah, think yeah, or at least the Daughters of the Pioneer Museum, if it's not in the official church, I don't know. Um, and then Rick Bennett followed that up and said, Joseph Smith also told Emma to write her own blessing while he was in jail and that he would sign it. Yeah, right. that's a good example. There, we do have some precedents for not doing things in person when needed. Um, okay, so let's, um, let me just ask you this question before we move on to the next topic here. Um, you know, although we, we don't really know what the future is going to look like regarding large gatherings, I know that, you know, we here in Utah are starting to move into what we call the yellow phase uh, coming this Saturday, where gatherings of up to 50 are being permitted so long as social distancing is still being adhered to, the environment is sanitary, um, and uh you know, so from a church standpoint, we're probably not ready yet, at least for the majority of Utah-based wards uh, to start gathering. Typically, there's more than 50 uh, per ward. Um, and usually, you know, we'd be bunched up pretty close together. But, you know, so we don't know when we'll be able to go back to the pews per se. Um, but I think it's safe to say that this experience has somewhat changed us uh, as a society. Um, so do you have any thoughts on what the church might look like when we eventually do return to the, to the pews and particularly for, for women? Yeah, I, um, I mean, I don't have any sort of, you know, concrete examples of how I think things will change. I think back to what we've been talking about all along, I think what, what, what we've learned is that when men and women are separated, something breaks in our church worship. When men and men are not present, um, we are not able to perform a complete worship. And if the opposite were true, if there were households of all men, which I'm sure there are at some place, um, nothing is broken if no women are present, right? Um, so they can they can worship fully, they can participate in the, the full rituals and ordinances. And I don't know how that realization kind of gets fixed on the local level, unless we go back to some of those things that we originally were talking about, about visibility, voice, and influence. Um, and I, I mean, I've heard some. I, I've heard some anecdotes of bishops and stake presidents. You know, but there was a, a bishop in particular that um, kind of, you know, Alda Monson has a ward of all widows or you know, majority widows. Um, and apparently, he has been refusing to partake of the sacrament himself as long as the widows in his ward are unable to. And so, I mean, I think there might be some instances of that kind of awakening and solidarity um, that that might be happening in our homes um, that that might start to bubble up and have some sort of impact on our our Sunday experience but um, you know I, there may be something where we have to bring our own water and bread <laughs> and just kind of eat it ourselves without you know, a tray being passed through 200 hands. Um, 
because even with the individual pieces of bread, we still have that tray being held handled by two, you know, well, I guess there are several trays, but at least several dozen people are handling those trays, right? So I don't know, maybe it becomes much more of an intimate sort of individual experience. Uh, I think something would be lost if we did that. But on the other hand, it might force us to, again, like I was saying earlier, have that integrity that President Nelson has been emphasizing. So I don't know. I mean, I don't, I don't see us sitting six feet apart in the pews. Maybe we will, at least initially. Um, but, but yeah, I, I mean, I'd be, I'll, I'm, I'm curious to see what other ideas people have, uh, specifically as it affects gender. Um, yeah, it's interesting that you brought up um, that it could affect how we how we pass the sacrament because that's exactly what happened with the Spanish flu, right? Is we changed the mode from using a communal cup to using individual cups um, after that. Now we'll have our own cups with our names on them every week. We just use that one. <laughs> Um, I mean, I think the temple is the bigger problem. You know, I mean, the endowment session is one big, you know, sort of palm palm exchange, yeah. right? So, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what we're going to do about that. Do you have any ideas? What do you think? <clears throat> Gloves. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I, that's, I, I think, it, I think it's going to be really interesting to see how we, how we phase this in. I mean, I, you know, part of me wonders if we would go to uh, a smaller, shorter ward model um, where we've got fewer people who meet for a shorter period of time and then sort of rotate through, you know, maybe that's, that's just the passing of the sacrament and. Um, maybe we'll hire real cleaners to clean our buildings. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. People will need jobs. That would be a great job. <laughs> that would be, yeah, that was, yeah. First, of course, the first thought that came to my mind is that you can clean the building from six feet apart from anybody else, but <laughs> the economic impact of that would be, would, would be pretty huge. Um, should we get into our, to our final topic here for uh, the evening and let people get on with their evenings? Um, thank you for sticking in with us, by the way, folks, this has been a fascinating discussion. We hope that you're enjoying it. Listening. Um, so BYU published a recent study titled "When Women Don't Speak," and the ar the article is available in the spring 2020 issue of BYU Magazine. Um, so I'm just going to give a brief summary of the article, then I'd like you to talk about how it relates specifically to women in the church. Now you had mentioned earlier in our discussion tonight that that this was a lot of the same research that you had used. Um, so the article examined gender dynamics in a predominantly male accounting program. This is not obviously not all the research, but for this article, um, a predominantly male accounting program. And this is a program where women incidentally graduated with higher GPAs uh, and with more leadership experience than their male counterparts. Um, the question was put forth, what happens when women are outnumbered? And after years of studying laboratory and real life settings, the study revealed that for women, having a seat at the table did not mean having a voice. Um, the article went on, women are systematically seen as less authoritative and their influence is systematically lower and they're speaking less. And when they are speaking up, they're not being listened to as much and they're being interrupted more. So in regards to this accounting program, they concluded that even though both men and women reported loving their groups, because of the study's finding, this program will not put women alone on a team of men again. Uh, so let's launch from here and talk about how this relates to a church environment. The first thing that pops into my mind is the ward council. So what are your, what are your thoughts? Well, when I was writing Women at Church um, six years ago, I was so excited. I just reached into my bookshelf to get it. I was so excited to find this book. Um, and you'll notice, whoops, where are we at? Chris Karpowitz is one of the authors of this BYU article and the research that you just mentioned. He here was a, at Princeton doing his doctoral work and partnered with a fellow Princetonian, Tally Mendelberg. But um, this was the book that I used when I was writing Women at Church. And the, 
the fun thing about it was that um, I didn't know when I picked it up that Chris Karpowitz was LDS or that he was at BYU. <laughs> um, and so I loved that irony of having a leading researcher in gender group dynamics be LDS and working out at BYU. So um, one of the, so, so I've talked, I, you know, and, and Jessica Priest has also been an incredible friend and, um, and supporter and colleague over these years as well. And so I just can't speak highly enough about their work. They're just, they're just consummate researchers and, and professors and thinkers. Um, the things that I got out of The Silent Sex, Chris's first book, were um, this idea that it's not good enough just to have one woman in a mix. He, the, it, it's fascinating to actually look at the changing impact that different percentages of women have on group dynamics. So if you have um, one woman out of 10 or like a 10% ratio, um, that woman feels and is treated like a token, right? Okay, we pat ourselves on the back, like we, we've got our representation, she's there, right? Um, but she, as they're saying in this article, often feels overwhelmed, that's different than having a voice, right? Being present there and being the token and be representing is different than having a voice. If you have two or 20% women in a group of 10, they are actually perceived by the majority group of males as colluding and it's actually a net negative because they're, there's suspicion around them, and they are not there. If they express an opinion, then they're they're seen as kind of being, you know, in bed with each other and trying to trying to get ahead together, which is fascinating, right? And so, they say that the sweet spot is um, three out of ten, or about thirty percent, where women move from being a token, they move from being seen as colluding with each other and just kind of, you know, being that the feminist infiltrating sisterhood to actually being on, on a level playing field. And I think what they're doing in this article and this new research is then saying, okay, well, it, when they get that seat at the table, then what? Now there's still some other hurdles. It's not good enough just to have the number. There's also some socialization and some, um, you know, very deep seated gender expectations that are preventing even those three in 10 women from, from having a voice. So I love their research because it really gets at the heart of my voice visibility and influence um, in paradigm. And they really are tackling multiple parts of it with this new article. So can we wrap it up by uh, relate, relating some of that to the church experience for women? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, we, when we go back to President Oscarson or President Nelson telling women to step up and to look for opportunities. Again, as I mentioned before, that's um, the women don't have those same concrete jobs, even from starting in young women's as, as the men do. And so I do think this very amorphous idea of, you know, being heard and stepping up uh, can play out when it comes to our, the stewardship of, of female leaders in a ward. There only there really are only three of them, right? Um, primary Relief Society and Women's. And um and so I think, you know, I just um I just was released a few months ago from being young women's president in my ward. And I just took that that stewardship of um my girls very seriously. Um but I think where I could have done even better and where I think we should challenge ourselves as women to do even better is to embrace our stewardship for the whole ward, right? And to really be confident and claim that spot of, you know, these are my girls and I'm responsible for them and I have the final word on them, right? But I can also um, contribute and participate in the larger discussion. And I I think that's the most obvious way that we women can follow the prophet's injunction to step up. Um, just because ward council is talking about a man or a family where there's a active priesthood holding father, our stewardship extends even to them. And I think especially with the new responsibilities put on the bishopric, 
especially with the reduced number of people in the ward council, it's more important than ever for women not just to be present, but to have that confidence to claim that stewardship and that that love and that expression of service um, over the whole ward. Excellent thoughts. Um, it brought to mind, so my wife has served both in the as a young women's president and in the primary presidency. So she's been on the ward council a couple of times. And one of the things that she had said that it always drove her crazy was how um, when referring to the men, it was always president so-and-so of each of the auxiliaries and referring to the women, it was sister so-and-so and that that little bit of imbalance, which again, isn't intentionally trying to be demeaning or it's just not present of mind, right? But well, it's also, I mean, it's a little more fraught than that because it also, it's a very frequent reminder that there are different jobs and offices for men that yeah. have right. own titles. And there's only one title for a woman in the church from the head of the Relief Society all the way down to a 12 year old girl. There's one name. Yeah, so. yeah. That's one area when we were talking about earlier, what are some things that we still need to work on? And that's, yeah. that's definitely an area that needs immediate attention. Yeah. <laughs> And I, I mean, I, you've heard me, I've been talking about President Oscarson and President Bingham and stuff, but yeah. I, I, and I, and that is, that is one area that I hear people making a conscious effort to, but again, that's not been sanctioned from the top and until the top starts calling them by that title, yeah. it's not going to be, you know, universally accepted. Yeah. Excellent. Um, well, I'm looking over here at uh, the comments and I don't see anything new. So I think I'm going to go ahead and wrap this up if that's OK. Um, so that ends our discussion tonight with uh, Nyland McBain. And we truly appreciate the time that you took to be with us uh, this evening. Uh, thank you to those who have contributed to our discussion. Um, and we appreciate the time that Nyland has uh, given us. If you came late to this discussion, it will be available through our podcast, the Greg Coford Books Author Cast, uh, which you can find on most podcast players or at our website at gregcoford.com. Remember, we are offering a sale on Nyland McBain's Women at Church, Magnifying LDS Women's Local Impact. Uh, it's 30% off of the paperback version. You can head over to gregcoford.com, and I think we're going to be offering that sale through the rest of the month. Um, also, if you would like to learn more about uh, Nyland's work with the Mormon Women's Project in Better Days 2020, you can check out those respective websites at mormonwomen.com and betterdays2020.com. Um, our next Coford Live Lecture Series is going to be with Michael Austin digging into his award-winning book, Rereading Job, Understanding the Ancient World's Greatest Poem. This live stream is going to take place in a couple of weeks, so keep your eyes out on our Facebook page for or uh, our newsletter if you're a subscriber to that uh, for the event announcement. Until then, we wish you health, we wish you safety, and we wish blessings upon you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you.